So good morning, everybody. Uh, Graham Hillary, Freight Strategy Officer at Bucks County Council. Uh, I, uh, I was going to give you an introduction to Buckinghamshire uh, and say how unique Buckinghamshire is as a county, because that's what they told me to say. Uh, and then on the train up, I thought, well, I'm passing through all these beautiful countryside that was all drowned. And I thought, I'm really lucky I live at the top of a hill. What I want to talk about is the freight strategy that we... <laughs> what, I, what I want to talk about is the freight strategy that we introduced in, in Buckinghamshire. And I joined Buckinghamshire County Council about 11 months ago, coming from a commercial world as opposed to from a local government world. So it was a very steep learning curve for me. Uh, having to work a little bit slower and a little bit more cautious and a little bit more thorough and things I think should take six months now take 12 months uh, and I was brought in to take the freight strategy that was adopted in 2018 and turn it into a, a series of actions and budgets so I want to just introduce you to that talk about the first project which is in a beautiful village called Ivinghoe uh, and then talk around some enforcement challenges that we have um, around uh, making the traffic regulation orders more effective. <laughs> Excuse me for the, the amount of, of content on here. The, the, the freight strategy, uh, as I say, was adopted in 2018. Uh, it's a sizable document. Uh, it's very complex in the way it words, and it took me a little while to actually understand what it was actually saying. I then tried to uh, turn that into a series of defined options and put a budget towards that, based upon the, the strategy here, which is to uh, encourage trucks to use the right roads at the right times. To, uh, to protect this beautiful countryside. They told me to say that as well. Uh, and, and, and really to encourage collaboration between uh, businesses and residences. Uh, and it's quite apparent that that isn't always the case. Um, and finally, to minimize the impact of moving freight through the county uh, and lobbying for improvements, which is work in progress. In this initial pilot in, in Ivingall, and, and looking at the freight strategy in general, it, we decided to look at uh, doing an area-based approach to traffic regulation orders. That is to say, rather than do uh, a restriction on an individual road and then do another one on a different road, was to look at it more upon a, a zonal approach, to try and make it a little bit cleaner, a little bit easier to manage. Uh, so rather than just taking a single structure or a single road, it's about taking a wider approach to things. It makes the interventions that are necessary easier to understand and easier, in theory, to enforce. It also helps balance that business need uh, and the community need for protecting the environment. It's important that in doing this that we have early engagement both politically uh, and locally that we talk to the, the councillors, to the officers within the, the county, to the parishes, to the districts, that we talk to residents and we talk to local businesses. It's about providing a balanced approach to this. But also, the interesting thing was about creating a, a body of advocates early on that you could make use of to get your message across. Uh, and I think in the case of the Ivinger one, as I'll come to, I think we have about 20 or 30 different people who are going out there selling the message. It makes my job easier. The Ivingo pilot, as I say, following on from the straight strategy, it's about promoting the appropriate freight routes where possible, 
it's about protecting those villages, it's about protecting those listed structures and buildings, it's about supporting business growth, which is all, often, often isn't always what the residents are looking for, uh, and it's about improving the cooperation between communities and the commercial world, and, and that's an interesting challenge. Uh, so it's about producing that balanced approach to managing freight movements through the area, protecting that resident quality of life, but supporting business growth, which is the aspiration of the county and obviously the aspiration of the businesses themselves. I hope you can see this. <laughs> this, is the, this is the map of the, of the area that's been defined as being in scope. You can see that there is really a, there's a, a defined shape to this. The, the red lines around the outside of the shape are the, are the freight routes that we would prefer trucks to use. Uh, and within that defined shape is the area where we will introduce a weight restriction. It's a seven and a half ton weight restriction, except for local access. So businesses that are in the area still get to come into the area, but the, business, the, the, the traffic that's passing through the area, we don't want them in the area. It's as simple as that. 47% of the HEV traffic that goes into the area is simply passing through. You can only do this approach if you have identified alternate routes. And you can only do this if you work with neighbouring local authorities. Uh, you can't do it in isolation. In fact, some of the area defined within the zone sits within Hertfordshire. Some of the signage that's necessary in order to advise people not to enter the zone is in central Bedfordshire. So I can't do it on my own. I'm reliant upon these uh, authorities to work with me. So the proposal is we implement an area-wide environmental restriction of seven and a half tonnes with an exception for local access. We promote freight routes around the area and understand the actual impact on those routes of the additional traffic. We pro proactively seek behavioural change from drivers. Wow, really? Yes, it's about talking to the drivers and making them understand that we don't actually want them in the area. And there's a reason why it's a proactive approach is, uh, I'll come on to that in a second, it's about the, the inability to enforce this restriction. It's about encouraging uh, enhanced business and, and community relationships. Uh, they don't exist, in fact there is an animosity and, and the message that I have to give is you need to talk to each other. Uh, the, the, the local authority, the local parish councils have a, a, a forum, a collective forum, and they have a transport subgroup, but they don't have any commercial transportation expertise on that at all. And you say to them, well, why, why is that then? And they say, well, they don't talk to us. Well, why haven't you invited them along? And you talk to the business and say, well, why aren't you there? And they say, well, they won't invite us. They don't want to listen to us. That has to change. This, pro this approach will only work if they work together. And due to the lack of enforcement, we, we are dependent upon the, the local people working to manage HGV vehicles through the area, about identifying vehicles that shouldn't be there and then trying to encourage them to move out. And then it's about working with uh, England's Economic Heartland and the Department of Transport to try and do something about the enforcement. The benefits of this is, is, is quite clear cut. For the residents, it reduces the amount of HGVs in the area, their quality of life improves, they stop fearing for the lives of their school children and their elderly. It's about supporting business and encouraging them to grow. One of the biggest uh, parks for HGVs is in the area. Uh, with 250 HGV vehicles every day. 
that move in and out. They employ 405 people, 357 of them live locally. So why would they not wish to improve HGV flows in the communities that they live in? So it's about getting them to actually understand that. Just quickly now, because I need me to move on, I just want to talk about challenges to this, this approach. And the biggest challenge is uh, and we're out there selling this now, we're moving into the consultation phase as we speak. It's about the enforcement of this strategy. It's about the ability to, to restrict those movements in the area and understand that they don't need to be there and for them to, to move away and about encouraging and enforcing that. Under the current regulations, we can't enforce. Uh, the only people who can enforce are the police and the trading standards. Uh, and neither of which, I hope there's none in the room, neither of which consider this to be a priority. They, they won't say that, but their, their, their emphasis is upon crime against the person. It's not against HGV movements in the wrong place. They tell me that what they'd have to do is they'd have to follow a HGV into the area watch it drive through the area and when it leaves the area then they can pull it up. It takes 15 minutes to get through the area, they can't do that. So we, we have to find another way of, of doing this. So in this particular case, given that we don't have any, any legal enforcement, in, we, we have to try and manage it creatively. So we will proactively seek to, to move vehicles away uh, before we introduce the traffic regulation order, we will survey the vehicles in the area and we will write to those organisations and, and suggest to them, politely, that they find somewhere else to drive. After a certain date, they will be liable to prosecution. I can't prosecute them, I hasten to add. They are liable to it. They probably will never get done and they know that. But uh, Central Bedfordshire did the similar sort of thing and they managed to encourage 80% of the vehicles away from the area before the regulation order was in introduced. If we can just get 50% out without doing anything, that might be amazing. And then the local resources have agreed that they will monitor HGV movements in the area and if we find some, we will write to them unofficially and ask them to leave. Uh, and, and finally, we, we will promote the need for change uh, for the uh, adoption of the uh, Section 6 of the Traffic Management Act, which is what London have already. Uh, uh, introduce the use of fixed penalty notices in magistrates' courts, and ideally have the monies that are collected following the enforcement. It's an expensive proposition. To, to enforce that particular area will require in the region of 22 different AMPR cameras. You can't do it manually, you have to use technology to do it, you need software to follow it through, you need licenses to, to get the information from the DVLA. So it's an expensive proposition. Unless you have the money following the enforcement, it, it won't work. Uh, back office tools we need. Yeah, so it, it, effectively, if you have the money following the enforcement, it becomes self-financing. If the money doesn't follow it, it, it will never get done. And finally, <laughs> data. I, I have to admit, I'm not a great data person, to be honest. I, I might know the question, but I don't know how you get the answer. I know what I want, I want the answer to be, but, but I'm reliant on other people to do it. In order to do this, you need to, to survey all the time. You need to do a survey before you think about doing it. You need to do a survey once you've done it. You need to understand the, 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 the flaws of, of trucks through the area and the flaws based upon the options that are in front of you. As it stands at the moment, we tend to use an external provider. It's expensive. It's very expensive. And they don't necessarily give you what you need, and that, that's down to us not defining it properly in the first place. But it just means that we have to rework the information that they give us. 
And, and they need to understand that it's not just a case of capturing the information. They need to work it into something that's more usable. Uh, we need more data on, on HGV movement from origin to destination. Uh, and I understand that, that you know, regional, regional transport bodies will be looking at that on a strategic basis, but we need to try and filter that through local roads as well as far as we possibly can. Uh, as I said, when, when we started doing this, we did speak to other authorities, and, and it's quite apparent that trans traffic regulation orders is, is something that we all do. It's also quite apparent that we all do it differently. We all have the same expectation, we're all looking for the same result, but we all follow different processes. Naively, I'd say that if we're all looking for the same result, surely we should have one single process? And instead of reinventing the wheel every time, uh, we should all be working towards one best practice. Uh, and that seems to be an obvious thing to do. Uh, and at the moment, in, in this particular case, we're trying to work traffic regulation orders across three author authorities on three different processes. Not very easy to do. But that's the, that's the pilot freight strategy for Buckinghamshire. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Graham. I think we'll, we'll open up the floor very briefly if anybody's got any questions. If you do, put up your hand. Hopefully Tom will get you with the microphone. If you can just announce who you are and where you're from, that would be great. Okay, good morning everybody. Carla Jakeman from Innovate UK. Um, thank you, Graham. I thought that was fascinating what you were saying about behaviour change with regards to the drivers. And this is kind of a question generally to everybody, not, to, not just to yourself. But if you've had any positive experiences of changing driver behaviour for, for passengers as well as goods, please do tell me, stick your hand up now and tell us. But, um, you know, we're really interested to hear, especially with working with local authorities and SMEs and using innovation, how we can change that behaviour because it is a massive sticking point. So well done for tackling it. It, it is a real challenge. I mean, the, one of the biggest problems is, is of course, satellite navigation systems that truck drivers are using now, just Google Maps, phone systems. So they're in there half the time because that's what the sat nav is telling them to do, and they're not necessarily truck sat navs. We, we are working very closely with the local road haulage association on how we can best uh, achieve that, that approach. But it is a, a big problem. I think, to be honest, if we manage to get, you know, 50% of the trucks out of the area that we can, that, that's a big improvement. Yes. Hi, morning, Graham. Thanks for talking to us. Um, Alec Beale from Here Technologies. <coughs> so we provide the roadmaps that go into SatNav. Um, we rely quite heavily on the TRO system for changes. Um, so it's good that you touched on TRO system. Uh, one of the issues we have with local authorities is that they only publish proposed TROs. This is what we're going to do. They don't publish sealed TROs. This is what we, are, we have done. So that's a real issue for us. So I'd like to know, are you going to start publishing sealed TROs to say this is what we've done so we can use that? Or are you going to carry on doing what you're doing right now? Secondly, you touched on a uniform approach to TROs. Have you heard about the TRO Discovery Project? Yeah. From DFT. So hopefully Bucks are going to get involved in that. We're also involved in that as a stakeholder. It would be great to get lots of local authorities working on that to put their data into a central repository that will then push their data out to people like us and TomTom Tom and all the other guys who provide SatNav. So first of all question, TROs, are you going to start putting out those sealed orders? Well, one, one of the first things I noticed when I, when I joined was that the uh, the, the, the county records for traffic regulation orders is, is woefully short of the mark. Uh, there is significant difference between what's actually out there and what centrally we believe to be out there. <laughs> some TROs don't exist on the road, some do and shouldn't. Uh, and, and there's a big black hole at the moment that, uh, that we're trying to close. W we think it's around 80% accurate, which is woefully short of expectations. Uh, and if we can close that, then we'll be in a position to be able to say to people, we have an accurate picture of what the situation is in the, is in the county. Honestly, at the moment, we don't. Mm. 
Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. My name is Tom Zander. I'm from Newcastle University. In the northeast, in Tyne and Weir, we've had a freight quality partnership now for almost 25 years. And to answer your question, um, it's been quite effective in changing driver behavior. And one of the things that we found quite effective is one data, so being able to clearly and simply explain to the people in charge of the fleets what the outcomes of, of different behavior are. So for example, changing driver behavior usually reduces um, fuel usage. So you save money if you change the way you drive. But we've also found it's quite useful to get drivers out of cabs and onto bicycles uh, and driving around so they can see what it's like to be a vulnerable road user relative to being a truck driver. What I would say on the whole is I did find your presentation to be quite punitive. You seem to view um, freight as a problem. Um, and I'm sure that uh, a colleague from the RHA would remind you that without freight, we won't have an economy. So I do recommend some kind of freight partnership and a slightly more positive attitude. Thank you very much. My, my understanding is that we used to have a freight quality partnership in the area, and it folded. To meet the requirements of the government. The, the government required freight partnerships for uh, LTP3. So there were about 50 appeared across the country, and about 49 of them disappeared six months later. If you're going to do it, you've got to do it properly. Yes, yeah, uh, and, and, and to be honest, I'm, I'm very keen upon making sure that we have strong freight relationships with our neighbours. I, I don't believe we can do it in isolation.